Welcome to Zimmerman Podcast, Episode 77. I could not be more excited for today's episode with Dr. Kesa Coppola. My regular audience might know her as the California doctor from my book, Sleeping with a Stranger. Dr. Kesa is the incredible doctor who first told me that daily overwhelming fatigue isn't a normal side effect of having kids and that having no desire to have sex with my husband wasn't normal. I'm so grateful that Dr. Queso was willing to sit down with me today. If you are a mom, a wife, a business owner who is struggling with fatigue, health issues, or just a blah feeling that you are just not your best self and you don't know how to get there, this episode will change your life. All right. You ready? Let's do it. I'm Jessica Zimmerman, and this is Zimmerman Podcast. I'm a serial entrepreneur, mom to three, and professional oversharer who has spent a decade building my business and helping others do the same. From wedding floral design to business education, features in Martha Stewart Weddings and Forbes magazine, and even writing and publishing my best-selling memoir, Sleeping with a Stranger, my business has kept growing, evolving, and changing year after year, just like me. Because the best thing about building a strong business is the freedom it gives me to live a full life. And that's what Zimmerman Podcast is all about, sharing real, transparent, in-the-moment reflections about how to live a life, build a business, and lead a family through the good, the hard, and the messy. That's what we're doing each week right here on Zimmerman Podcast. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Kesa. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. I am so excited for this conversation. You have no idea. Okay, so my audience knows you as the California doctor from my memoir, Sleeping with a Stranger, which you just read. I just finished it a couple days ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What did you think? I loved it. I loved it from the get-go because I'm from Mississippi. So I was immediately just, as you described the houses in Arkansas and everybody loves their garage and the backyard. And so I was in from the get-go, just being from the South. Mm, Uh, Yes. I, you just tugged at all the strings. I feel like the whole way through the book. So I found myself kind of weepy and I, it was, I was totally engaged and was up late until I finished the book. Oh, well, thank you. Well, you played such a huge role, you know, in helping me heal my body these past, I guess, year or so. And I'm just really excited to talk about that with you today. So usually I ask guests to fill me in on their background at the beginning of each show, but I kind of want to work backwards with you since you and I already kind of know each other. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for those who haven't read the book, well, first of all, you should, Um, but (laughs) but I got to the point about a year ago where I was just totally out of energy and I'd been working with Kara Clark, who is my nutritionist, who I love. And if you want to hear from her, you can go listen to episode 17, but I had totally changed my eating habits. I'd started exercising regularly and I was still crawling into bed around four o'clock every evening, you know, just totally exhausted. And it made no sense to me. And Kara, you know, from the very beginning was like, you've got to go see Dr. Kesa. So I did. And the rest is his. Do you recall that first meeting at all? You know, it's funny. Yes and no. I remember you because you're from the South. And so that always stuck out. And so when Kara told me you wrote a book and I thought, well, what did she write a book on? Weddings? Like I, you know, I knew you as the wedding person. And so I, I didn't really remember what you and I had talked about other than I remember you had babies and I remember you were tired. You know, that's kind of, that's what I remembered about you. Yeah. And so I went to the book. I didn't want to look at your notes. I wanted to read the book and kind of see what the story was without me remembering anything. Right. Well, you have so many patients. I mean, I'm pretty sure I was on a wait list for like four or five months just to have have one appointment with you. So, I mean, I know your time is super, super valuable. So I didn't expect you to remember our conversations at all. It's amazing the things I do remember, though. I remembered you. I remembered exactly who you were. I just didn't remember your clinical complaints, really. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I was, you know, as, as you know, now from reading the book, I was experiencing extreme fatigue and there was also a component of just not being into the idea of sex at all as well. I thought that was all just, you know, emotional due to everything Brian and I had been through with his illness. And I hadn't even considered that there might be, you know, real chemical hormonal component to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you, it was very obvious when we first spoke about what was going on with you just based on your life leading up to that. Yeah. I think that's fascinating how we can just, you are in California, I'm in Arkansas and we just had a conversation just like we're having right now. I remember it so vividly. I had all three of my kids in like a gymnastics class and (laughs) I I, remember that. Do you remember? (laughs) And I just was pacing the lobby back and forth for, I think we, I think I talked to you for over an hour and I just paced back and forth to the point where I remember after you and I hung up, because I'm usually just right there sitting, watching the kids the whole time. And I was just pacing because I was trying to basically tell you my whole life story in an hour. And I remember the owner of the gym came out and she never comes out and she came out and she was like, Jessica, are you okay? Is everything okay? Like, <laughs> cause I just was pacing back and forth talking and I was like, yes, actually, I think I'm sorry. I've just been, I just haven't known what's wrong. And I think we might finally have some answers. It was like everything that you said to me that day hmm. it was like the missing puzzle because what I got really frustrated at, and you know, this from, from the book is that I just got to a point where I didn't believe these doctors. I just was like, this doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense to me that I just felt like I was always questioning, always questioning. And even when I started feeling, you know, tired myself, everyone would say to me, oh, Jessica, you've got three kids. You've got a business. You've got, you know, like that's normal. And I just kept thinking, no, that's not normal. But I'm also a pretty confident person and I'm I'm pretty in tune with myself. But I just think of all the people who listen to that excuse and think that that's actually truth. Like, oh, I guess this just is normal. I think that's the biggest misconception with all over the board is that people think suboptimal health is fine. Mm-hmm. You know, that It's okay that I'm tired. I have three kids. It's okay that I don't feel good. I'm getting older. I mean, I hear that with people in their 30s and I'm thinking, no, 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 you haven't even hit middle age yet. Right. So I think people are just so kind of numb to what they're supposed to feel like because it's not, it's, you get to feel great. You get to thrive and have energy. Yeah. Being sleepy at four o'clock is not from three kids. No, you're exactly right. Okay, so there's a scene in the book that describes our phone call when you asked me how long it had been since I'd had sex with my husband. I laughed out loud when I read that. And what made me laugh even more was you when you gave all the scenarios of what I should have said. (laughs) I was like, I would have loved this or this or this. And I, you know, even clinical silence would have been nice. But instead, I got Jessica, honey. Why haven't you had sex with your husband? That's a problem. And I thought, but I'm so glad because that's what I needed. I needed to hear that. I didn't need to hear someone go, it's okay. That's just, it's, you know, we're in, we're in the mode of survival right now with small kids. And that's, I needed someone to slap me into reality and go, that's not normal. Um, Do you commonly treat women who have had signs of adrenal and hormonal issues, but just think it's normal because we've sort of been conditioned to believe that women have low sex drive? all day long. I mean, it's the number one. I mean, I think hormonal imbalances is probably the number one thing I see in my practice. That and gut issues, uh, all types of gut issues. And so, so the hormonal imbalances I'm pretty keyed into, you know, depending on your age, depending on your work, depending on all, all kinds of things of where we're at in that hormonal picture. So I, you know, as you described your story, I could tell exactly what was going on. And, you know, and the low libido is, again, one of the top things I hear all day, every day. And that's, there's something to work with. You know, when that is the case, there's, there's emotional components to it. There's hormonal components to it. There's physical components to it. There's all kinds of things, but that's, that's part of that's part of getting back to balance is that part has to be expressed. That part has to be healed and kind of looked into. Why do you think hormonal issues are more difficult to treat or are 
then then let's say a broken arm. You know, you go into the doctor and they they can put a cast on, they figure out how to heal it pretty quickly. Why is the hormonal thing so much more difficult? Oh my gosh, because it's our lifestyles. I mean, a you know, a broken arm, you put a cast on, you don't move it, then then it gets better. But when there's endocrine imbalances and you're still burning at both ends and you're still not taking time for yourself and you're still lacking those quiet moments where you lean into what might be a little uncomfortable. Again, I tell people all day long, I can put you on a million herbal glandular supplements. We can change your diet. But if you're still on that go, go, go mode, on that sympathetic fight or flight mode, you can't heal. So unless you change many aspects, your diet, your nutrition, your exercise, your thinking, your lifestyle, it's not going to correct. So you really have to approach it on, uh, from a lot of angles. And so that's, that's why it's hard because a lot of people aren't willing to do that. It's scary. It's scary to kind of start um, stopping and leaning into some of the things that you've been running from for so long. I really just came from a place, honestly, I, I had gotten, I, you probably remember, my dad had said to me in the middle of the street, when did you become so mean? Mm-hmm. And I just went inside and I just remember looking at myself in the mirror and thinking, I don't think I've ever met the best version of myself and I want to meet her. And that was, you know, soon after is when I got on the wait list to, to talk to you. But it really, I mean, I have to tell you, after speaking with you, and we we kept speaking for about six months, but it wasn't that long until I started feeling better again. Mm-hmm. You know, it was amazing how just the effort, yes, you have to change a few things, but it's just... I, don't you want to see the best version of yourself? Don't you want to know that person? I mean, that's where I came from. You were so far along in that too by the time we spoke. So you had been doing some therapy and you'd been working with Kara. So mm-hmm. so much of it, you were you were already saying, hey, whoa, where am I? Let me find you. One of my favorite moments of your book is when you talk about, I think it was Zeke. Yes. He was a baby and he held your face. And yes. he was like, where are you, mom? You know? Yes. yes. I love that moment because you were already trying to connect with the real you. And so the, I just had to fine tune you. You know, Kara got you on a great diet. You were exercising. Granted, we had to tweak a few of those things, but you had already started the journey. And so I love it when people come in and are ready, are ready to start the journey and are ready to really kind of have a paradigm shift that says, no, I, I got to get back to me. Then we get great results. Right, right. The thing with Zeke that is so interesting to me, and I feel like you'll get this because I feel like you also have some some intuition, some just, I don't want to say psychic ability, but you can, you have a sense of people. You can feel an energy or something, there's something going on that you, where you don't even have to physically meet with people and you can kind of tell what's happening. And I want to talk more about that in a second, but Brian always tells me not to say this out loud because he's like, people will think you're weird, but I don't care. I say it anyway. I too have intuition. And i that's why I can so easily, um, I think sometimes people think I'm cold or I'm not the friendliest. I can just really read energy. You know what I mean? And if if it feels not genuine, then I just don't have any time for it, you know? And I feel like I can sometimes know exactly what's going to happen and predict things. And I feel like Zeke has that too. And I feel like Zeke is a 65-year-old man in a four-year-old's body. I love the way you described him because I, you know, I get that too. And so when you can really have that with your child or see that or feel that, I love yeah. that. Yeah. 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 What are some signs that we can look out for that might be indicators of some hormonal imbalances? Because I know that our listeners, a lot of them, a lot of them, are women, they are moms, and they're trying to run their own businesses. So they are burning the candle at both ends. At both ends. So, you know, the moodiness where it shifts from either weepy or irritable. So that that just wanting, just not having a capacity to really pull from, not having a foundation of emotional well-being to pull from, you know, just quick to respond. 
traveling aches and pains that don't necessarily stick to the same spot. Maybe it's a knee pain one day and it's a low back pain. Maybe it's a neck pain, but low level inflammatory uh, pain signals. And oftentimes it could just be one area that just hurts. Low back pain, chronic low back pain when nothing's really wrong with your back, but your back is stiff and can't loosen up. Um, Telltale adrenal fatigue Shortened cycles or prolonged cycles are obviously something's going on. Inability to get to sleep, kind of the, that's just the circadian rhythm's a little off. Cortisol's high at night, so you can't quite turn off. That was me. That used to be me because I would, I mean, I was so tired. I'd have to crawl in bed at 4, 4.30, but I wouldn't fall asleep until 1 a.m. can't fall asleep. So so tired because cortisol's flatlined throughout the day, but then it tries to give one last little peek at the wrong time because the circadian rhythm is so off. So that inability to get to sleep or wakes often because again, cortisol and insulin are doing a little dance that's not where it should be. So a, usually a low libido because again, it kind of you, you have zero capacity to give in that way when you're just feeling so separate and misaligned from your own body. So low libido, traveling aches and pains, or a chronic low back or knee issues, headaches. Headaches are oftentimes because of hormonal imbalances. Sensitivity to bright light when you really just have to wear sunglasses every time you step outside um, is really telling of an adrenal issue or hormonal imbalances. Still, that still happens with me. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's usually still a little bit of an adrenal fatigue. Mm hmm. So I can always tell when I can't go without my sunglasses that I really need to kind of do some balancing. Craving salt, like really needing salty foods because your sodium is low and that's an adrenal issue. Painful sex can be an issue or is an issue. And it kind of depends on where we're at in our hormonal history that, you know, we're having that are just a few. And it's you. The first thing is the fatigue, just the generalized fatigue. If you don't energy if you wake up tired and or afternoon hits and you cannot function and just the need for a bunch of coffee or sugar or other stimulants to get through the day. Right. What do you say? Because I just remember when I spoke with you and I I just was like, okay, first of all, I don't understand why people don't. I don't I don't know if I'm just more assertive, but I don't understand people who have a knee problem and they don't get their knee checked out. Like they just live with knee pain. I don't understand it. So for me, I'm like, I am tired. And even though everyone tells me that this is normal, I know it isn't. And maybe that even is a drive that stems from wanting to get to the root of the issue as soon as possible because of what happened to Brian, because, you know, life is short, which I learned from, you know, losing my sister. And so maybe that's part of it. But I just remember saying to you, I'm exhausted, but I'm, but I'm doing everything right. I'm exercising and I'm eating correctly and I'm going to bed and I'm getting eight hours of sleep and all of this. And then you took one by one and you basically, it was like, I had this whole puzzle that was 99% filled. And it was like talking to you and you put the last piece in for each issue that I had. You were like, no wonder you can't check your email and get, you know, answer simple emails because your brain is foggy. That's why, because of your, your adrenals. Uh, no wonder you're tired. It's borrowing from your thyroid. No wonder you don't have sex. You, it's borrowing from your ovaries. You know, everything that you said just made so much sense. And it honestly, it validated me. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It made me feel like I'm not crazy. You know, like, okay, this actually all makes perfect sense. And so I just need to do what she tells me and I'm going to feel better. And I have to tell you, I mean, today, besides the sunglasses thing, (laughs) um, I I wake up at 4.30. I have an hour and a half to myself before my family wakes up. We all go to bed at 8.30. I feel rested. I feel, but I also think that has a lot to do with just taking time for myself and having, you know, what, what we say is self-care. And I think, man, a lot of women have a problem with that. What do you say to people who think adrenal fatigue isn't a real thing? Well, I hear that a lot because the medical community doesn't like to call it adrenal fatigue. They say that is not a diagnosis. They like to call it um, HPA axis dysfunction. They like to kind of involve the entire endocrine system and talk about how 
it's a syndrome. It's not an actual disease or diagnosis. So I think, I think it's nitpicking. I think who cares what it's called and who cares if there's a diagnosis or a syndrome versus disease, it's a real imbalance. Right. And it usually involves cortisol being the dominant hormone that is stealing from the other hormones. And our body is trying to create homeostasis. And that's what the endocrine system does. If something is overreacting, something has to under act to make a balance. So it's in allostasis trying to find homeostasis. And so again, if you're go, 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 there's no self-care, you're burning at both ends, you only have so many hormones to kind of keep up with that type of thing. And, you know, I always say back in caveman days, you were chased by the scary animal and it's you went into sympathetic fight or flight mode. So all of your adrenaline, norepinephrine, cortisol starts going off to save you from the saber toothed tiger. You get to your cave and then you're safe. You're fine. So caveman days, job done, check. Now I'm going to rest. I'm going to eat. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to breed. I'm going to do all these things because my body, I just saved myself. But these days, it's as if we're kind of being chased from the saber-toothed tiger all day long. So we don't have time to bring in parasympathetic activities to balance out that, that endocrine response, that cortisol, epinephrine, adrenaline response. So, so we're sympathetic dominant with not enough parasympathetic activity, and it's going to create mayhem. It's going to create inflammation, which will then deplete the immune system, which then gets high hormones and low hormones. And we can't be aligned. We can't function. We can't feel good or thrive or heal for that matter. Okay. So summer 2019, imagine me waking up at 5 a.m., taking my kids to the gym while I work out with my trainer, going to the pool, playing blocks on the living room floor, and then wham, totally out of energy by 4 p.m. Crawling into bed in my Christmas pajamas. I was already doing all the energy boosting things I could think of. Then my nutritionist told me about Bee Powered from Beekeepers Naturals. I just take a spoonful of the Bee Powered Superfood Honey every morning, and I'm not kidding. I see a huge difference. I know not everyone can have a nutritionist, but anyone can get this superfood honey, and I'm making it even more accessible for you. If you use the link in my show notes or simply go to ZimmermanPodcast.com slash B, you'll get 15% off your order from Beekeepers Naturals. So if you're a tired entrepreneur or foggy-brained parent, you need this stuff. Again, go to ZimmermanPodcast.com slash B-E-E. How common are hormonal imbalances? I mean, I look, hormonal imbalances are, I mean, I could probably say everybody has a little bit of them, but not, that's not so true, but it's what I see. So I see them all day long, every day. They're very common. Now, to the extent that they're imbalanced might not be as big of a deal because I, I always say it's, I do functional medicine. So I try to catch it before it's a diagnosable issue. So I try to kind of keep people before they're having to go to the endocrinologist or the rheumatologist or the immunologist. So we try to catch it before it's a diagnosable condition. But that being said, I have many thyroid, Hashimoto's, PCOS. I mean, I get all the diagnoses too with people who are trying to manage it so it doesn't. Because once there's one diagnosis on an endocrine level, there's many that can follow. So you want to you want to turn that dimmer all the way down so it's not creating a slippery slope. So it's not creating more. So there's not more diagnoses. So even one or two diagnoses, fine. Let's turn that dimmer all the way down so we don't involve more. One of the things that you said to me that really opened my eyes was about birth control. And I don't know if you remember this conversation, but you had said to me, you know, you've done all this basically being in like an eternal autumn. You expressed to me that there was the the way women's bodies are supposed to work, how men have, you know, their hormones are released in 24 hour period and ours are in 28 days. And when you said that, it was like a, I'm a very kind of visual person and it made so much sense like, oh yeah, it's normal to like 
be be tired in the evening and want to retreat. And it's makes more sense at like 10, 11 noon, you're more ready to go and do things and everything. And I thought, wow, she's breaking that down into weeks. And when I started to really realize that and do further research after our conversation, it blew my mind, you know, that you could really become so much more productive because we have a lot of listeners that are, like I said, they're entrepreneurs and they're, and they've, they're moms and they're, they're doing a lot of stuff. And I thought, you mean if I could get my cycle in sync with my productivity, like I could be more productive. And I, you told me not to do anything rash that we would talk in a month and we would discuss me going off birth control, but I immediately went and threw my birth control down. (laughs) I I do remember that because I remember thinking, well, let's just bookmark this conversation and we'll, you know, let's take our time. This is this discussion. You have to think about this. Um, yeah. And I think the next time you're like, I'm done. I was done. I'm done. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I told you at the time that I'd never took another pill again, but I just was like, no, it just made so much sense. They almost felt like poison to me, like that they had kept me stuck in some, in some way. Do you find that a lot with, with people? I do, you know, and I think so many times medical doctors, you know, young girls get put on birth control to help, you know, manage their periods. And even though it might manage the symptoms, it's not helping the body. You know, it's not, again, you're taking synthetic hormones. And if you've been on birth control for more than a handful of years, usually you're going to then have a thyroid issue, you know? So, and so many times people take birth control for decades and then eventually just move into synthetic hormones, you know, hormone replacement hormones for their bodies never had a chance to even work like they're supposed to. We don't want to turn an under functioning gland, even more under functioning by putting it on a synthetic hormone. We want to encourage it to work and we want to encourage it to do the dance and to kind of, and again, each day of the month, it's a different relationship between the hormones and you want them to interact with each other. You want them to work accordingly and do this beautiful dance from the inside, not, not quiet one down by taking synthetics. Now, that being said, sometimes people have real issues and, and birth control really does help their issues or their symptoms, I should say. And so then I, you know, then my, my suggestion is, all right, just try to keep it for less than a handful of years. So we're not turning everything off completely, you know, that there are side effects that the doctors don't communicate there. They, there are long-term effects that are happening that just really aren't discussed. Right. Absolutely. So what age do does someone typically go through menopause? This is my new, not obsession. I don't want to say obsession. I'm not there yet, but I feel so good right now. I feel like you and Kara together have helped get me to where I just, I feel like I'm 20 again, as far as my energy. So I'm just like, I want to stay there. (laughs) And I know, you know, it's, I'm 38, you know, when do you start having to supplement? You're going to be in business a long time, right? So I can just keep calling you. Yes, honey, just, I got you. I got you. Okay. (laughs) But the mean average age in the United States is I think 51 is what they've come up with 51 for the average age of menopause. Okay. Um, But really come mid forties, late forties, I start, you know, we start doing the dance is what I tell people. We start really managing the rest of the endocrine system. So I start looking really closely at the thyroid, at blood sugar, at the adrenals. Um, We really want to make sure the brain is kind of spitting out all those hormones like it should. So going into mid to late forties, I'm, I'm really paying attention to that, to do that dance. Again, I see a lot of early menopause in my practice and it's because of cortisol. So when you're in that sympathetic overdrive for a long time, you're going to, you're, you're stealing from your sex hormones. So then you start to go into an early menopause, but sometimes correcting that, then I get women, they start cycling again. But I think the average age is about 51, 52 and come 47, 48, 49. I'm, I'm on it. I'm kind of making them, we're, we're starting to do some, some adaptogenic type herbs and minerals and things like that to kind of fill in the potholes, I always say, and really help that balance. I remember you saying something, talking about going back to sex for a minute, 
And I said, well, I just, you know, my husband's had this illness and it's just, it just has been hard to, you know, be intimate with him after having this, you know, terrible illness. And, and you said, and I didn't put this in the book and man, I should have, I'm just now thinking of it. I'm just now remembering it. But you said something like, honey, I don't care. Like, don't, don't even worry about him. Like you need it. Your body needs it. Like women need sex. So like, if you have to just like use him, use him, like get, like just, you need sex. And I thought that was so, I I honestly, too, I just needed to hear that too. Cause at that moment I was just going to do anything that was beneficial for me, you know? And when you said that, that kind of helped me, you know, get back on the horse. If, if I can use that expression, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but, um, but what is it that is, that is so good for us as women? Because I know that there are other women out there that are like, I don't really want to have sex. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And that's the last thing I want to do. So why is sex so important for us? It's an, it's an expression. It's a, it's an alignment with your, like your female divinity, so to speak. And so often we think of sex as trying to keep our husbands happy. So we think of it as something they need. It's something else we have to check off the list. It's somebody else who needs us. It's something else I have to do to make everybody else in my family feel loved and needed and wanted. So we take it outside of ourselves to make our husbands happy instead of, man, I need to be touched. Never mind him. If I were to take it as a sensual, tactile sensation experience, what do I need? What feels good to me? And sometimes with certain people, it means go take a bubble bath and and just have a and light some candles and kind of romance yourself a little bit. It really means selfishly what we need touch. Babies, the first thing they need to do is go on a mom's chest and feel skin to skin contact. We're meant, we need touch. And so sex, when we look at it as what our husbands want, it's another to do thing. But when we take it as even what I encourage my patients to do, and I laugh, I laugh because you wrote it in a book of what I, the conversations I have all day long are about sex, which makes me laugh. And I did not expect that from your book. I did not remember that you and I had those conversations. So that really made me laugh. But it's it's true. It's like, okay, never mind their needs. If what about touch? So often women were constantly touched by our children. Our husbands want to have sex. Everybody needs from us. And we just don't want anybody to touch us. You can't even pee without them, you know, right there oh, by us. Right. I, my my dog is even in, in the bathroom with me. Like I still can't go to the bathroom alone. Um, but it's it's not about that. It's about, okay, what kind, what kind of alignment? Let me get back in touch with my feminine, with my goddess inside of me, with my my sexual desire, my, my need to feel connected. And there's something really aligning that sex can do for a woman if it's about the woman. And so even communicating with your husband that, no, tonight's about me. And maybe it's just cuddling. Maybe like, but there is a thing that we get to be selfish with it. We, it, our husbands would be stoked, you know, of just saying this one's, this one's going to be about me tonight. I've got to get back in touch with my body, my sexuality, my desire, my feminine self, and start expressing that. And we can ask for that help with them. It's really about us aligning with ourselves. Absolutely. And I think that there's so much that goes behind it with, you know, I think when you've gained your confidence, that makes it a lot easier to ask for what you want. Because I think, you know, we're at our most vulnerable selves when we're, you know, having sex. And so I think, you know, doing any kind of work that you need to do, right, whether that's go to therapy or, or, you know, uh, start eating better so that you feel healthier and you are healthier, but it's got to, you just got to start doing the work because I am here to tell you, it's so much better. Like it's so much better once you've done the work and it's so, it's really enjoyable. Yeah. And, and on that note real quick, cause I always say you can't get there from there. So meaning if you're hating your body, if you're not feeling attractive, if you're not feeling sexy, you're not feeling pretty anymore, 
you've got to start finding ways of self-love because you're not going to change that until you have to accept it. Whatever you resist persists. There has to be like canceling those thoughts of I'm too fat. I'm not pretty. I'm not sexy. You, you can't expect to align when those are the thoughts that come into your brain. And I hear that all the time from women. And so it's really a matter of practicing self-love, practicing choices that really bring you back to your God's child. You're aligned. You're beautiful. And as soon as you start feeling that, then the choices are easier to help progress that. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And and I think so many women don't want to have sex because they don't like their bodies, but that's not it. We have to start getting in touch with our bodies to want to start making good choices for our bodies. And I think too, there's got to be something else to it because men don't care. Most oh, of them don't care. You're never going to see a man sit there and look. A woman is like, oh my gosh, I have so much cellulite on my thighs. And a man is thinking, a naked woman. Awesome. Yes. It's like he is not looking <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. Logically, if we know this, then what's the problem? You know, that's why I think there's just something deeper there. Yeah. It's really a lack of alignment. I say it all, it's just a lack of alignment with yourself. And sex is a great way to come back into alignment with yourself if you're allowing it to be a moment for you. Right. Absolutely. Do you believe in affirmations? Do you think affirmations work? I love affirmations. I have one caveat with affirmations. I grew up with um, Louise Hay, like, you know, everything, you can heal your life, you can heal your body. I love all of Louise Hay stuff. She's old school affirmations. My only caveat is it's the feeling you have to go for. You have to feel what you're saying to really manifest it. So you can say, I love my life, but if you don't love your life then it's really hard to manifest that. You're more, you you still have too much contrast. So you have to go, so I love affirmations, but I love, okay, what's the, if I were to say, um, I love my, my thighs and I don't mean it, then you, what I have my patients do is what, what would you feel if you loved your thighs? Okay, I would feel sexy. So then you want to start like, okay, so what are things that make me feel sexy? You, It's the feeling we're going for. Mm-hmm. So I love the affirmations and there is a fake it till you make it, but you've got to bring in the feeling of what you're achieving or the feeling of what you're trying to bring in, not just the, the goal, the thing you're trying to go for. What's the feeling that the thing is going to bring you? And that's what you're trying to connect with. Oh, that's so good. I say that when it comes to a Pinterest board, because People will often pin, you know, all these houses or these interior designs or whatever. And I think, you know, if you really look at that, that house you just pinned, there's no real connection. Like you don't live in the town that that house was built. You don't know the architect. You didn't pick out the paint color. So what is it that made you want to pin that? And it's always a feeling. It's a feeling. If I had that house, I would feel accomplished. I would feel financially stable, I would feel, you know, uh, su- successful, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it, it all goes, you're right. It Everything goes back to a feeling. Everything. Because it's well, not the thing you want. You want the feeling that that thing brings. So then I always say connect to the feeling. So what's the feeling? So if you, uh, same with a relationship, you know, oh, I want a relationship. You don't want, the, you know, what if this shitty relationship, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, go right ahead. Horrible relationship came into your life. You don't want that relationship. So right. let's talk about the feelings of the right relationship that you're trying to create. And then those are what you go for. So in my morning meditation, I try to feel secure, try to feel just abundant, try to feel like I'm just thriving and changing the world. And that I'm here to serve from so much capacity. So you just want to bring in. So I love affirmations because they're still identifying what it is you're trying to do, but just take it a step further and say, what is that feeling that I'm reaching for because of that. Like why am I even that? Cause that has nothing to do with it. We're trying to get to the feeling. Right. I think some of us are natural manifestors. Yeah. Yeah. Like it comes naturally. And then for some people, I think it takes a little bit more effort and work. I want to detour for two seconds and talk about manifestation. I mean, um, 
meditating for a minute because Kara taught me, I guess it was about this time last year, you know, just she approached it by saying it's passive prayer and then did this box breathing with me, which is, I really just kind of been, you know, uh, doing that. And recently, you know, when everyone was asked to stay home um, because of the the COVID-19 pandemic and everything, I really got into a mode even more so of, you know, realizing I'm in complete control of the environment of our home, you know, with just music and and candles and all of that. And it kind of took me down this rabbit hole of I could bring my meditation to a new level. (laughs) And, you know, so I kind of started doing some research and, you know, buying incense or sage or what's, what's it? Pal- Palo Santo. Oh, Palo. Yeah, yeah. So I so I have all this stuff on order. It's coming. Um, and the incense have already arrived and I've been burning those. Brian is like, what is happening to our home? Um, but I, so what all do you do? Like new crystals really have energy. Like tell me how one can bump up to the next phase of meditation. I mean, I, you know, I could get weird in this conversation. So I, you know, I always <laughs> say I have to be so careful with what I let people, because I do, I love it all. Like I mm-hmm. know um, crystals have so much energy. Now I will say I'm kind of new with the whole, I don't, I think of my friend, Brittany, who runs my office. She's all about crystals and knows the energy and knows which ones you bring in. And, you know, they're all over my office because she's picked them out. I, I mean, I sage, I Palo Santos, I have grief altars because I learned that from some indigenous shamans in Peru. I have, um, you know, I do fire burning ceremonies to, to get rid of attachments that I'm not, that aren't serving me anymore, you know? So, and kind of depending on the person, I love sharing those tools. I love sharing those. And again, even when I'm doing, I'm like, this is weird. What is this even doing? But it's still an energetic, it's intentional. You know, it's still an, an, an intention of releasing something or of really of saying, moving something. Yeah. And in, you're right. It's just an intention. It's just an intention. I don't think there's any right or wrong way to do any of it. And when people say, oh, you didn't do that right. No. No, this is all, this is all your personal expansion and growth you know, and connection to yourself and to God and to, to everything that is. And so there's no wrong way to do it. To me, for even this, you know, what I've been doing in the morning at 4.30 is just, there's not like meditation happening at 4.30. I'm, I, I don't do that yet. I do that a little bit later in my morning, but mm-hmm. I just it burning some incense in this one certain candle. And I have this like Joni Mitchell playlist that's going really softly. And I have my morning, you know, collagen <laughs> um, drink. And just sitting there for 30 minutes, smelling those scents and listening to that music and the light is super dim. There's like one lamp on super low. It's just, it almost is like my brain in, you know, starts to think, oh yeah, here's another day. And we're gift, you know, we're appreciative for this day and grateful. And we're, we're starting it off by just giving yourself the, you know, the, a moment and some respect and some time with yourself, to, you I know, and that. There's, so there's no meditation going on right there. It's no, just but that's still a passive moment of you saying you're worthy of this. I'm going to receive this right now. And what, another on those same lines, there's something with whether it's incense, whether it's essential oils, whether it's sage or Palo Santo, those those receptors still communicate with your brain. Oh, this is my time to meditate. Yes. Oh, and you know, they have frequencies, so to speak, and everything speaks with frequency. So they have frequencies to say, oh, this is where my, this is communicating with my body to allow, to release, to open. So those smells still tell our brain, oh, this is my time. Same with music is we hear it and we can immediately go back to a moment. So I always tell people, have your meditation music that's similar or, and or the same thing, because that's when it's kind of like a toddler brain. You're saying, nope, we're getting ready for nap time. Here's the different senses that I bring in to tell your brain what we're about to do. Yes. Even last night after my kids got done playing, I said, okay, it's time to brush your teeth, put on pajamas. And my daughter said, I'm just going to wear this. I put this on like two hours ago and it's super comfy. And I go, no, baby, you have to put on pajamas because that's what tells your brain it's time to sleep. Yeah. 
So and if we treat our brain like a toddler, no, 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 this is what we're doing. So whether it's, again, the smells, the sounds, the touch, the candle, you know, the dim lights, you're doing all these things to tell your brain, this is mine. This is where I align. This is where I expand. This is where I heal. And even if it's three minutes or 20 minutes, I tell people, go to the same chair, go light the same candle, have the same sense and the same music. And then just let that be the prayer. Let the light come in. And that's your time of just allowing. And it's beautiful. That is a meditation to me. You're right. You're right. It is a meditation to me. It's beautiful because you're just saying, I'm hitting the pause button and I'm letting my body just be. Right. And everybody needs that. Sleeping with a Stranger is officially available everywhere books are sold in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Since the book's launch, I've been amazed by how it's been received. From being named a bestseller by USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, Amazon, and Barnes & Noble, to incredibly personal and touching reviews from my amazing readers, it's been such a wild journey. Here's one of my favorite reviews. There are a lot of books out there on marriage struggles, but this is the only one I've ever read that gives the gritty truth about what happens to a marriage when a health crisis entirely changes the dynamic both people signed up for. Heartbreaking at times, funny at others, honest throughout. Sleeping with a Stranger is the ideal book for anyone who's wanted a behind-the-scenes look at the way relationships can fluctuate, struggle, and thrive. I can't wait to share this story with you. To get your copy, go to jessicazimmerman.com today or wherever books are sold. And to make sure you get all my upcoming book tour updates, join the newsletter list now. What did you think of the uh, the guru doctor in Arkansas that Brian that I took Brian to? So I was so curious about him from before because you mentioned him before when we yes. spoke on the phone. Um, so I was curious to see what you would say. Yeah, I mean, I've met a lot of healers or or seers or whatever you you know call them. I'm fascinated with them. I love, you know, the truth is I've always. Sometimes I'll look at somebody or talk to somebody and I, I hear something and, you know, and, and I have a knowing of what's going on. So when somebody's actually, that's all they're doing, you know, I have a medical de- degree to back mine up just in case I don't know or I don't get anything. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. When people like just do that and that's their purpose and I'm fascinated with it. It is. It, it was fascinating just to watch him write on that card, ask three questions, and validate a feeling. I, mean, I, I, just, I, I, I was a little jealous. Like, I think jealousy <laughs> might be the word that came to my. <laughs> yes. But I thought it was cool. I love that. But you are so good. And then there's Dr., I believe, um, Dr. Henderson, who is who we saw with Brian. Mm-hmm. And she was really fascinating because she had, had a medical de- degree. Her whole thing was she was in the medical field and she just didn't like the way it was going anymore. She just was thought, why are we not actually looking at their bodies? Why are we not running actual tests? Why are we not asking more questions? And, you know, just like I did with you, I just find it fascinating how we would go to a doctor and as, you know, a a medical professional and they would ask a few questions. We were given a prescription, but with Dr. Henderson and with you, it was like over an hour of just Lots of questions, lots of questions, and and very quickly, people we got better. So, what what was your kind of journey into kind of where you are now? Yeah, my journey was hormonal issues. I um, I was raised in the South, and I had we were raised actually I had the hippie parents, so we were raised vegan in the South. So that was always interesting. I cannot imagine. Yeah. In Starkville, Mississippi, we were the vegan yeah. family. You are kidding me. Yeah. Oh, that's right. This is right. <laughs> I just remember. Yeah. It was, I wanted to, I remember I would have sleepovers and my mom would make everybody need the bread and like have good intentions. They put in the bread and I was always so embarrassed because, you know, it was in the... <laughs> just remember it was a totally different childhood. Um, and there was just a lot of, uh, gluten and grains and it was a bit, you know, it was no meat and no, 
it wasn't a lot of the right choices for me as a person. And I had lots of hormonal issues. I was diagnosed with endometriosis and polycystic ovary. And they tried to put me on the pill and I had gained a lot of weight and just never, I remember being buckled over. They diagnosed me with irritable bowel disease. I couldn't get a break. I was had so many digestive issues. My periods were horrible on and off the pill until I was probably in my 20s, early 20s. And I had moved to Boulder, Colorado and saw a natural doctor who practiced applied kinesiology. And she helped me. She was the first one who says, you know, you got to go off of gluten, dairy, corn, sugar. She took me off of kind of everything I even knew to eat and started a nutritional protocol, supplements and herbs. And within, within months, I was better. You know, I started having normal cycles. My gut started to heal. I was fascinated with it. And at that point, I was uh, getting my master's in psychology. And I was going on the psychology route of things, but I was so fascinated with the way the body mind worked. And as soon as I started changing my diet and changing the way I kind of viewed my health, realizing that um, it all went together. And so I came out to California and decided to go kind of follow that path career wise. Because I was so fascinated that my body responded so beautifully when I was thought I was doing all the right things. I mean, you know, thought by doing vegetarian diet, thought the diet cokes were better than the cokes, right? You know, thought that all these things I was doing, um, but it was constantly inflamed, constant gut issues, tons of hormonal imbalances, and just kind of this low level depression that wouldn't go away fatigue, the whole bit. So it was me. It was what brought me into this was my journey through this. And I was, I loved it because it really connected with me. And I wanted to share people. I wanted to share with people how it's, it's not just one thing that changes. You got to look at a lot of different areas of your life and kind of move toward that way as a whole. Right. Kara, who is Carla in the book, um, my nutritionist, she really helped me with learning how to in, eat intuitively and honestly just kind of how to live intuitively like how to just check in with yourself what do i what do i need what do i want you know what is my body craving is it craving rest is it craving a brownie <laughs> is it okay is it cra- you know all these different things and just really listening and being honest not not what do you think it wants but honestly what does it need and i think that you do such a good job of listening I mean, you, you and I have never even met in person and you were able to uh, suggest supplements to me that just helped immediately. I mean, is that just because you know what you're doing or is some of that that intuitive feeling? Yeah, it's definitely an intuitive feeling. I mean, you know, before anybody, I kind of, I get a vibe, uh, you know, you, as you tell me your story, you know, as you said, you were pacing back and forth in that gymnastics um, in the lobby <laughs> I'm, I I'm picking up on you so I'm listening you know like I really am you know people complain if I don't work 60 hours a week but the truth is when I'm working it's because I'm really tapped into you so it was you know 90 I have 90 percent of the information I need just by the time you're done with your story with me you know right um, yes and and so it really is just, a, I kind of just plug into you a little bit and can, and again, there's also a lot of clinical experience. It's not all just, Ooh, I think this is it. You know, it's from experience. But if I've heard a lot of similar stories, I kind of knew your age. I kind of got your gist of where you were coming from. And I have a lot of clinical experience to know what's worked in the past with other patients. So some of it just is clinical experience and some of it is, I, something you say might have really gotten my attention as opposed to the four things before I kind of breezed over, you know, so whenever I tune in like, Oh, that's a piece, you know, I, I hear the parts I need to hear. And I'm not always right. You know, sometimes it really does take longer to kind of iron it all out. And it might be because there's more layers to work with. You weren't that difficult because I, all the work you had done previous to me. So it really is a matter of in the story, the story tells it all. The story tells it all. When my patients tell me their story, that's where I, I'm listening and I hear it. 
And it's a trial and error too. Um, Sometimes it does take time and sometimes something doesn't work and we have to try something else. I'm very humble to the process because everybody is different. Are mainstream doctors not doing this because it's a business and they need to see as many people in a day as possible? And so there's just not the time to do that? Is that what that is all about? I know a lot of that. I know a lot of my friends and colleagues who work for, you know, who work in, you know, a group of sorts or something, you know, they only have 10 minutes with their patients. So they really are trying to, you know, what are your symptoms? Let me give you something. And again, GPs, medical doctors are trained in pharmaceuticals. That's what they're trained in. They're trained in pharmaceutical medicine. So that's kind of their toolbox oftentimes. Now, luckily, functional medicine, integrative doctors, like this is becoming more and more of a thing. So these doctors are now going to get more training in integrative care. But I still think they're really busy and just don't have that one-on-one time to really tap in. But I do think that these, I have a handful of doctors who I know are really educated in integrative care and in functional medicine and are doing a great job. So I think it really depends on the person and their practice of who, you know, of who it is. But I think mostly, yeah, they don't have the time or the knowledge. They haven't been trained in that in medical school. Is this mainly an American thing? I think so. I do think so. I mean, your Australian doctor kind of said that, that he was, he had more, you know, American patients than not Mm because now people are starting to get frustrated and asking. Mm Mm-hmm. Another thing I see, and I hate to say this, but I'll say it, is so many doctors who are getting into functional medicine and integrative medicine kind of throw the kitchen sink at you as far as supplements go. Mm. It's because it's what they've learned. And so I feel like they, they're, a lot of times I'll have patients bring in bags and bags and bags of supplements that somebody put them on. And there really is kind of a nice balance that you have to figure out with supplements. That being said, I do a lot of supplements and I take a lot of supplements, but I do think sometimes if somebody just throws 20 things at you, you know, go, go slow, go slow with those right. things. When did you and Kara connect? Kara and I connected, gosh, how long has that been now? A few years, three years, four years ago, she brought her daughter in. And it was funny. I liked her from the get go, but it was her, it was over her daughter that we, we connected. I had, I didn't know that she was a nutritionist. I didn't know that she was who she was. I didn't, I don't know a lot of people. So I didn't pay attention to that. And she kept telling me she was a nutritionist. And I was like, yeah, yeah. You and everybody else in Orange County. Right. <laughs> So, so I remember I just didn't pay that much attention. And it was a few of my other patients who would either see her in, or no, it was people who were like, oh, do you know that Kara, you know, wrote about you in her whatever? And I was like, who who did? What? I don't know. Because it was her daughter who I was working with. And uh, so anyway, yeah, it turns out she was a big deal. And I didn't know that. And I loved her. You would never know that about her, you know, because I just really connected right. to her as a mom. And uh, yeah, and I have just loved her more and more. The more I get to know her, the more I just want to be around her. She's really special. She's one of the only people in my life that I've ever just, I was walking through a room and there was something that pulled me to her. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I have to go sit by this stranger and ask her about her life. And I yeah. that. when I read that the book, I was like, of course that's Kara, because yes. that's what you want to do with Kara. You just, yes. she's really special and she really is there to serve. She really is there to help lighten, lighten people. Like she's there because she loves serving. She's amazing. Yeah. How interwoven our nutrition and supporting your adrenals. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I, that's why I work with so many of Kara's clients because they're most of the work's done. I just have to go and fine tune. You know, when somebody comes in and doesn't have a nutritional foundation, it's going to take us a while before we can really get to the clinical side of things because we've got to clean it up. We've got to clean everything up. So nutrition is huge. And it's why I work so closely with Kara now is because she's teaching everybody the rules. And then I just get to come in and make a couple tweaks and we're done. 
So it really makes my job so much easier when they've gone through CARES program and or know um, how to eat, you know, because it matters. It matters. Right. The, the inflammatory, what you eat um, says so much about your health. And if your body doesn't recognize a food as good, it's going to fight it. So it's going to treat it like an antigen in your body and it's going to create inflammation if it doesn't like it. Right. So if you're trying to fix an inflammatory issue, but you're eating an inflammatory food, you're not going to get anywhere. Right. So true. Okay. So I'm really excited because our next episode we're going to do uh, with Dr. Kesa and Brian, because everyone has been messaging me and emailing and asking, how is Brian now? How is Brian now? And so you and Brian have actually never met. And so I kind of love it. We're going to have kind of an on-air appointment, which is going to be really good. So you'll have to check that out next time. But let me end with this one last question. And I ask everyone this question. I don't know why. I just think it's fun. Okay. So if you had Oprah's money, so billions of dollars, and you had to spend it on something totally selfish just for you, what would you buy? I thought about that. I think you're, I think, so. okay, so what did I come up with? Because I forgot that you were going to ask me that question. And I decided I was going to buy land and this wonderful open beach house in Morea, one of the Tahitian islands. And I was going to spend half my year there. That would be perfect. Oh, that is so good. And then I, love I could even have retreats there or friends and just like this nice open area with guest houses. And to- that would be so good. <laughs> well, I'm coming to California um, soon. Oh, I've got awesome. promo for the book. So me, you and Kara need to meet for lunch or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we've talked about you a lot lately. So I would love that. That would be great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kesa. Zimmerman listeners, if there is any podcast episode I beg you to take action on, it is this one. If you're feeling exhausted, like you're physically and emotionally flatlined, like there's something wrong and you don't know what it is and you're just waiting for permission to say enough is enough, I am giving you permission. This is your permission to invest in yourself, to find a provider who is willing to listen to you, to create a life that will fuel your body and balance your emotions. There is a better life waiting for you. When I first met with Dr. Kesa, I was experiencing one of the most lucrative years in my business, but I couldn't enjoy that business success until I took care of my body. If you want a business and a life you love, you have to take care of yourself. If you thought of someone while you were listening to this episode, please share this episode, rate and review the podcast, and encourage your friends and loved ones to listen. Your shares and feedback make Zimmerman Podcast possible. And I've got some good news before we close out for the day. Keep your eyes peeled for another episode featuring Dr. Kesa. She'll be back to help heal us again real soon. Well, friends, I'll see you next week right here on Zimmerman Podcast.